Ivermectin and oral antiviral treatments for COVID-19. In today's Ask Dr. David, we're going to be looking at all of this and more. Hi, Dr. David. Hello, and hello, everybody out there in the internet world. So today we're going to be talking about antiviral oral treatments that are potentially on the horizon and also looking at where ivermectin may fit into all of this. So let's start today's discussion by first just having you explain to people what is an oral antiviral therapy. So similar to how an antibiotic stops bacteria from replicating and growing, an antiviral treatment stops viruses from growing. An important um, distinction, though, is that antibiotics do have a negative in that they can also kill off the beneficial flora, the bacteria that we have on our intestines, in our skin, in our mouth. But um, antivirals don't kill off any things that they shouldn't be killing off because there are no beneficial viruses that would be in our body. So is ivermectin an example of an oral antiviral therapy? No. Ivermectin is an antiparasitic medication. There, the discussion is about using this as a repurposed medication and to seeing if it does also have antiviral properties against COVID-19. Okay, so we will discuss that a little bit more later in this episode. And also we have a couple other uh, Ask Dr. David episodes specifically on ivermectin. So check those out. So what oral antiviral therapies for the treatment of COVID-19 are currently on the horizon? So the first one that we have heard about for oral use, there have been IV ones that have been available for use in hospitals. But the first one has been developed that's coming out is from Merck. This is going to be in front of the FDA to see if it gets approval. We will see if it does. It's actually called, and I'm going to have to look at the name of this one because some of these medications are, are, are pronounced very weirdly and spelled weirdly, but it's Molnupiravir. Molnupiravir just rolls right off of the tongue there. When this was announced uh, um, about a month, month and a half ago by Merck, and they had originally in their press release had said that it would be 50% effective in lowering you know, mor morbidity and mortality when looking at high-risk patients. But as many people may have heard and the more recent research that's coming out with larger data set is that it's only actually having 30% effectiveness for, for that. And so that's one of the questions that'll be interesting to see if the FDA would even approve a medication that is only 30% effective. I guess we will find out what happens there. Now, in terms of how this particular medication works, it's what's referred to as a nucleotide analog. So our DNA, as well as virus RNA, if you remember from like any kind of biology that you may have had, that the, there are these nucleotides that make up the genetic code. And what this medication does, it's kind of like a false nucleotide. So when this is put into the gene as it's replicating, and it does this enough, it creates errors in the genetic code that therefore no longer allows the gene to replicate, I mean, the, the, the virus to replicate in the manner that it is supposed to, and therefore pretty much knocking the virus out that way. Now, does this particular therapy, has there been any uh, incidents shown um, for potential risks to any specific populations? Yeah, so being that it's a nucleotide analog, which of course means it's disrupting the genetic um, replication, there is concern, there's been some animal studies on this, as to what impact this could have, especially in people um, who are trying to conceive for their, for, their, for their baby, for their offspring. Because if DNA at the very early stages is being, um, is being altered, what effect could that have in terms of birth defects or other issues, um, fertility in that early stages? So that's one of the concerns and why there's actual discussion right now as to whether this would even be allowed to be used in women of childbearing age, those who are trying to conceive, those are pregnant. Now, this medication also itself, the way that they are proposing what they're putting forward to the FDA is a eight pills each day, four pills twice a day for five days. So there, it is a lot of pills to be taken. Of course, if it was a miraculous thing, people would take lots of pills. But we're also talking about a lot of pills that may or may not be actually be all that effective in the first place. Okay, so that is specifically the Merck one, and I won't try to say the name of the actual medication. Um, let's talk about the Pfizer medication that is also on the uh, on the boards right now being studied. Yes. So the while the Merck actually has um has gone is more going through the FDA approval process, the Pfizer ones is is coming up next. 
And this one is called Paxlovid. And what it is, is that it's referred to as a three chymotrypsin-like protease inhibitor. And what the initial data is showing is that 89% effectiveness in, that, in those high-risk populations. So potentially three times more effective than the Merck product. Now, what is a 3C uh, chymotrypsin-like protease inhibitor? Okay, so proteases are scissors that break up proteins, proteases. Anytime you hear the word ACE, that's kind of an enzyme. And so this is breaking up the, um, the protease. So as a virus, in this case, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, is trying to replicate, what it has to do is it has to break down proteins in such a manner so that it can then put them into place to build the virus then that is replicating too so if this is serving as a cleaving a scissor like effect and 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 then the medication is stopping that that scissor like effect that cleaving from happening then the virus can't replicate because it can't do the thing that it needs to do in order to make itself again so that's really how the, what this mechanism is and that's how it's quite different than what we're hearing about the merck product so I obviously am not a scientist. I don't know a lot about this, but I have done some reading on ivermectin as it's being used in other countries. Um, tell me, isn't that kind of how ivermectin works or am I misunderstanding everything? Yeah, and, and I do want to make one point before we get to that, because what this medication is, is in, in, in addition to the Paxlovid, the, the protease inhibitor, and I'm going to have to look this one up again because of this thing, Ritona, Ritonavir is actually part of the, the 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 actual product from from Pfizer, and what it does, and it actually was originally used for HIV, is it slows down the breakdown of the protease inhibitor, making the protease inhibitor stronger. So this is actually two pills of the Paxlovid, one pill of the Ritonavir for three twice a day for the five days. So just in terms of it's less pills, but that's it's actually two different ingredients unlike the other. So I did want to just be clear about that before I answer your question. Now, regarding ivermectin, this is a similar mechanism mechanism of action that appears at least in the Petri dish to be what ivermectin's anti-protease inhi um, inhibition property is. And in fact, going back to a, a, a study that was was first um, shown in Nature Magazine at nature.com, we, we'll put this into the uh, description um, for this video here, but they looked at many different potential protease inhibitors, and they found that ivermectin was the only one that very significantly stopped SARS-CoV-2 from replicating at a level of 85%. That was better than other antivirals that are actually used that way. So, you know, we don't know... At what level does it get into the tissues in order to stop the replication? But it does seem that there's a very similar mechanism of action. It's not just a reissuing of it so that they can patent it. That's a different story. But in terms of the mechanism of action, the proposed mechanism of action, that's where the similarity lies. Okay. So one of the questions I've been asking myself, um, and I know others have as well, is if this Nature article that came out, from January of 2021, which we're recording now in December of 2021, so we're talking almost an entire year ago, is was showing this promising effect of ivermectin. Is it possible that ivermectin has not been more aggressively studied over the past year? Because it has been used for 40 years in humans, which means, as I understand it, it is a generic product. It could be repurposed and made into something not generic. But what that means is potentially the pharmaceutical industries would not be able to profit if they were using a generic drug to treat COVID. And so you have Merck and you have Pfizer and you have these other companies aggressively developing these new antiviral oral therapies. So give me some thoughts on that. Well, you know, a private company's primary job is to make money in order to, um, to satisfy their shareholders. We know that, okay? So yes, something that is generic that a, that a company cannot patent does not have nearly the same type of profit po um, possibility as something that they can patent and they can keep the patent and then they can and then they can do. So, you know, I, I know that there's been a lot, you know, concern about this and um, certainly, you know, there are, the history of big pharma is as such that, you know, I don't think that we can completely give them a pass on this because there certainly have been other instances where this is 
kind of what, what drives the research. You know, why is not more research done on vitamin D for that matter and for zinc on that matter? Again, it's not patentable. So, you know, and the interesting thing here is that the government will often subsidize the research and development of these medications of these new patents. And they will go through it, and but then the company actually gets to retain the patent and retain the profit. Now, it would seem to me maybe it would make sense that if the government is investing in these drug companies, maybe the government should actually make some profit off of it as well. That could potentially help in terms of income for our country as well. So uh, obviously that's not happening. Um, you know, um, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I think considering the history of Big Pharma, it's, 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 it's pharma, it's a, a fair thing to contemplate. Let's put it that way. Okay. And I do want to say that we will keep an eye on that as this becomes um, more known. Uh, we would like to do a little bit more research into this as these various products come on the line and we get more information. So we'll come back to that in another episode. As we start to wrap up here, I want to ask a couple questions that are sort of specific to oral antiviral therapies. So why can these therapies, um, how can these therapies be important in the treatment or the fight against the COVID-19? The treatments that are mostly available now for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 are pretty much injections, whether it's monoclonal antibodies, the resmosvir, um, that is an injectable form that's done in hospitals, or of course, and, and a lot of those are not even available unless a person's super sick. So th any kind of oral treatment runs the possibility that a simple at-home test can show that a person has COVID, SARS-CoV-2, and then they could potentially immediately start an oral anti and an oral therapy that could start knocking it out before a person gets to the point where they're sick enough to need to go to those more advanced therapies. And obviously the advantage of keeping a person out of a hospital, both in terms of the damage that would be incurred to the body at that point. But think of what the cost is to the healthcare system as a whole. Talk about bending a curve. If we can keep more people out of a hospital, ICUs, I mean, that would be a truly, truly remarkable thing. Now, the other thing about these treatments, which I really think is fascinating, because of the fact that this is actually stopping the virus from replicating, as we go through these variants, it's quite possible that these medications will still work against different um, different variants. Now, might there be a SARS-CoV-3? You know, God forbid, but let's face it. We've had one before this, so it's a possibility. Maybe at that point it wouldn't work. But for these different variants, what are we seeing as, of, of these variants? We are seeing changes in the genetic code that affects the spike protein. So that means antibodies that are made whether a person has had a vaccine, antibodies that are made once if a person has had wild virus, or antibodies that are presented to somebody through monoclonal antibodies, if the spike protein is changed enough, those antibodies might not recognize the virus and may have significant reduction in um, effectiveness against that virus. Whereas if you can stop the virus from producing in the very first place, that would mean that then we're talking about a significant game changer here. Right. And so just to clarify, I think you had said monoclonal antibodies twice, but one of the things that we discussed earlier was that the way the antibodies are currently in our systems are either through the wild virus or they're vaccine induced um, or there's the monoclonal antibodies. And so what you're saying Give is that one of the advantages of these oral antiviral therapies is that unlike the antibodies that we currently have going on that may or may not um, hold up efficacy against new variants, there's a very strong possibility that these oral antiviral treatments will. So as with everything, there's never sunshine without darkness, it seems. Um, what are some of the concerns related to the COVID antiviral oral therapies? Yeah, so of, one of the issues is the potential for cost, okay? I haven't heard a price tag attributed to the Pfizer one yet, but we are hearing $700 for a course of treatment using the Merck. Now, that's a lot of money. Now, we are hearing that the U.S. government, as part of the deal, would be subsidizing and potentially even paying for that. I guess we'll have to see how that will play out. But obviously, many people could not afford $700 for a five-day course of a medication. Now, there's another question. That's our government subsidizing us. What about in other countries? What about in Africa, other third world countries? Will they have the resources in order to pay for it? We don't know. 
I, you know, hopefully the drug companies, which let's face it, none of them are lacking for money. Um, will they be able, will they subsidize it in order to make it more available for, 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 for people? But also even, you know, in our country, people who are underserved, people may not be able to access a doctor because this has to be done by prescription. So if this can be prescribed, can a person access it? Will people in more rural areas or underserved areas, will those pharmacies be able to keep it in stock? Will there be enough produced actually to keep up with the demand? That's a fair question as well. So, you know, those are things that need to be worked out. You know, those are more logistical issues. Uh, you would think that a country of ours would be able to handle that type of thing, but certainly leaves a lot of uncertainty out there. And, you know, what do we want more of now? We would love to have more certainty in this most craziest of viruses that has been uncertain every step along the way. Right. So we're going to wrap up today's episode there, knowing that this is going to be a continuing topic. So I invite you to leave comments below. Feel free to ask us questions and check out our social media platforms. Check out some of our other YouTube videos. And we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Have a great day, Dr. David. You want to sign off? Yeah, have a great day, everybody. I'm looking forward to seeing how this plays out. Take care now.